Section 1. You will hear a man giving some information about transport in London. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Hello. Can I help you? Oh, yes. I was wondering what the best way was for me to get around London. Well, there are a lot of possibilities. As you probably realise, the main ways to get around are bus, train and tube. Oh? The underground. Oh. It depends how much you want to spend. Mm. All forms of transport offer special tickets, such as cheap day returns on the trains and so on. Overall, you'll spend less on the bus as it operates on a basic flat fare for each journey. Mm -hmm. But, of course, it may not go to where you need to travel to. Oh. The mainline trains only operate in the outlying areas, though a few cross London, whereas the Tube has stations which are placed in central areas of the city, close to the main sites and shops. Mm. Obviously, there are more bus stops... Uh, but you will probably have to change buses to get where you want, which can be inconvenient. <sighs> you will find that the buses are mainly in the central areas, but some tube lines go quite a long way out of London, so you could use this for longer journeys. Mm -hmm. Having said that, the tubes do get very crowded, so you should use the train if you want to sit down. <sighs> it does depend where you're travelling to. Well, I'm living on the outskirts, but I have to travel into London to college every day and then around London when I'm here. Mm. OK, so time is going to be an issue for you. Mm. The Tube should be fast crossing London, but quite honestly, there are so many delays that it's not very efficient. Again, the train has fewer stops, so is probably your quickest option to get to and from college. Huh. Of course, which service you use might depend on how frequent it is. I mean, the trains might only be every 20 minutes or whatever, but a timetable is published to save you hanging around. Oh. There are a lot of tube trains at busy times of day, but fewer at other times whereas the buses run every five minutes through most of the day, and there are night buses. But you'll need to check out your route first. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. You will hear part of a lecture on the current and future use of mobile phones. And it's interesting to look at the different ways that men and women use phones now as that does affect how the technology will develop. Some research has been done on how people use phones and some of the results are surprising. One of the increasing usages of mobile phones is to get all sorts of data, such as phone numbers, the weather, train times, etc. And while there's been an attempt to set up connections with things that women might be interested in accessing, it is overwhelmingly men who do this. But what about the traditional use of a phone? To speak to people! I suppose we would predict that it is mainly women who use phones as a method of contact for friends and family, but, in fact, the genders exploit this facility equally. I've spoken about the increased business usages that phones will offer, and I suppose we would associate this usage with men. The survey picked up, though, that women are often working from home, or catching up with work in the evenings, so they use phones in this way as much as men do. 
Most of us are aware we can store photos on our phones. It's an ideal method of capturing a moment wherever you are. Women tend to be the group that keep photos on their phones, but it seems that men use their phones to actually take pictures much more than women do. And of course, all this knowledge affects the marketing that the companies will do in order to sell the. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear an accommodation officer telling students about different halls of residence. You now have thirty seconds to read questions eleven to fifteen. Good afternoon, and welcome to Stanton University. I'm here to tell you about the various halls of residence we have available, should you choose to come here. We aim to offer accommodation in halls to all first-year students, and you'll find there's a good variety to choose from. First of all, there's Brown Hall, which, as you'll see, is not the most modern of buildings, but it is very popular with some students. It's got a good sense of community, some nice refurbished kitchens, and unlike the other halls, it has recently had a gym built in its basement. Another option is Blake Residence, which is built like a large house, and so everybody cooks and eats together. It has its own sectioned-off bit of private garden, and is even more peaceful because this is an all-girls residence. Although, of course, boys are allowed to visit the hall, and、uh, I understand frequently take part in cooking dinner. The largest hall we have is Queen's Building, and this has been upgraded recently. The original parking area has been built on, so that the hall now has a large common room, and each bedroom now has its own shower room, which many students regard as a real bonus. A further option is the Parkway Flats, which won an award for design in its day. And this building now has a preservation order on it. This has meant that only a limited amount could be done to upgrade it, and the surrounding area is important, so parking is not permitted around the flats. However, the flats do have many extra facilities, such as a special computer room, a small library, and a self-service restaurant. The cost of breakfast, lunch, and dinner is covered in the fees for this hall, so it does look a bit more expensive. The last residence we can offer you is Temple Rise, which again is slightly more expensive than other halls, as the rooms are larger. This has got very lovely views across to the coast, and this more than compensates for the fact that bathrooms here are shared between six students. However, the hall has domestic staff who clean the rooms once a week, so this is perhaps an attractive option for the messier amongst you. You now have thirty seconds to read questions sixteen to twenty.
Now I'll tell you why I want to transfer between classes. Mrs Brooks, I really like my teacher and my classmates, but I find it very hard not to speak in my own language. I just begin to think in English when the class ends, and I'm surrounded by other people from my country, so it's natural that we all speak in our mother tongue. I have been looking around for a class where there are very few other people from my country, so I'll be forced to use English. The best class I can find is the evening class, which begins at 6pm. Most of the students in that class come from countries which speak Spanish, and I can't speak a word, so I must use English. I have an Italian friend in the class, and she tells me there are two Hong Kong Chinese, six Spanish speakers, and one Japanese student. She says most people speak English at the break, although sometimes the Spanish slip into their own language. I check the class list, and two students have dropped out of the evening class, so there should be room for me. Could you please see if I can join the class? I'm not sure what the class number is, but the evening class I want is in room 305 of the Trotter Building. The class I'm in now is next door to the Trotter Building, in Prince Tower, so it's very easy for me to find my way to the new class. I'm not going home until late today, so could you please leave a message for me at my friend Margaret's house. Her number is 812-7543, and she has an answering machine. I do hope you can transfer me, Mrs Brooks. If there is any more information you need, please call me. Thank you very much. That is the end of Section 2. You will now have some time to check your answers. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3 First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Now listen to more of the conversation between Angela and Bob. Why do you want to take leave, Angela? I'm going to visit my Aunt May. She's my mother's sister. She and her husband are my guardians while I'm here. Where do they live? About 50 kilometres from here. Near Armadale. Do you have to take so long if they live nearby? My mother is coming with me. She's come for a holiday, so she wants to have some time with me. And I want to spend some time with my mother, too. Aren't you going home soon? I've applied to extend my time here. I expect to go home in 12 months. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. OK, what do we have to do now for the project? What's the best way to go about it? Um, well, Professor Carter suggested we set up a focus group to get some in-depth interviews, but I think that'll take a lot of time. Yeah, I agree. If we did a focus group, we'd have to spend time deciding who to include in it, and it's not necessary to do one anyway. 
Oh, fine. And if you agree, I think we should get in touch with the businesses on the list Professor Carter gave us, and ask them if they're prepared to participate. Sounds good. Uh, then we can go there, give them questionnaires, and collect them later. Exactly. Okay. Then do we need to book one of those study rooms in the library, so we can work together to input the data? Perhaps not, as I guess just one of us could just sort it out. Actually, yes, that would be easier. A lot of what we're doing is qualitative, so it'll be writing up rather than statistics. No software for that, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> And I think it would look better if we had actual shots of some of the staff, because we're citing appearance as a factor in employability, aren't we? Yeah. Okay. I'll factor that all in when I sort everything out tonight. I'm glad we decided to work together. I think it's going to work out well. Yes, well, given that we had to work in pairs on this project, I think we were right to choose each other.、Hmm. We complement each other academically, as we're each good at what the other isn't. <laughs> in fact, we should have tried working together before. <laughs> yes. Now, how shall we split the work? I'll do the analysis, shall I? Oh, okay. It's just that it might be faster, because I'm used to doing it. Although your English is better than mine, I need more practice at reading. Really. Okay, I'll do the presentation then, if that's okay with you. Yeah, sure. I don't mind speaking in public, but I hate preparing all the notes for them. The thing is, the tutor said one person should do the whole presentation, and he said he expects me to do it because I haven't done one yet. No, that's fine. Now let's see. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a talk about the pitfalls and pleasures of being a postgraduate student. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Postgraduates are about as easy to define as catching steam in a bucket. Courses can be vocational, for training, as research, as a preparation for research, or a combination of these. Also, you can choose between full-time and part-time. Increasingly, the approach to postgraduate study is becoming modular. The vast majority of postgraduates are doing short, taught courses, many of which provide specific vocational training. Indeed, there has been a 400% increase in postgraduate numbers in Britain over the past 20 years. Current figures stand at just under 400,000. People undertake postgraduate study for many reasons. These may be academic, intellectual challenge, development of knowledge, vocational. Training for a specific career goal, or only vague, drifting into further study. 
It is essential that you determine the reasons you want to become a postgraduate. If you have clear goals and reasons for studying, this will enhance your learning experience and help you to remain focused and motivated throughout your course. Where you study should be based on much more than the course you want to do. For some courses, you're likely to be there for several years, and it is important that you are happy living there. Check also what type of accommodation is available, and whether the institution provides any housing specifically for postgraduates. Choosing an institution and department is a difficult process. To determine quality, do not rely on the reputation of an institution, but find out what the ratings are from the most recent assessment exercises. Find out about the staff, their reputation, competence, enthusiasm and friendliness. Visit the department if possible and talk to existing postgraduates about their experience, satisfaction, comments and complaints. Be very careful to check how they feel about their supervisors. Also, check what facilities are available, both at an institutional level, for example libraries, laboratory and computing facilities, and in the department, for example study room, desk, photocopying, secretarial support, etc. Everyone will have their own priorities here. I am always anxious to check the computer support available and regard it as slightly more important than library access. Your working environment and the support available to you plays an essential part in making your work as a postgraduate a positive experience. Life as a postgraduate can be very different to your other experiences of education. Things that can distinguish your experience are the level of study, independence of working, intensity of the course, the demands on your time, and often the fact that you're older than the majority of students. These factors can contribute to making you feel isolated. However, there are several ways you can make sure that this is either short-lived or does not happen at all. Many student unions have postgraduate societies that organise social events and may also provide representation for postgraduates to both the student union and the institution. Departments can also help to create a sense of identity and community and often have discussion groups available. Don't be afraid to talk to staff about any difficulties you might be having. Of course universities provide counselling services but we have found that the best advice comes from talking to other postgraduates who may have faced similar difficulties. Okay, now many of you will have heard about the predicted death of newspapers as people increasingly access the TV and the Internet for their news. Today, I want to look at the USA, which has very advanced news sources, to see if this is actually true. In the USA, the main news sources without doubt are TV, the Internet, and the press. That is traditional newspapers. And although they are each surviving and growing, they are also changing. Obviously, TV news has been around for a while, and the early evening bulletins when people get in from work are very popular. I suppose we traditionally think of the morning newspaper arriving on our doorstep with the daily news, Interestingly, this is not borne out by the statistics, which show that readership in the U.S. is much higher when people have time to relax, when they're not working, especially on Sundays. The Internet is also a popular weekend activity, but shows no variation with weekday access. So people are using the different sources in different ways. Interestingly, local radio has been hit less by the grip of quite strong local newspapers than by the Internet, which is seen to offer a better regional service. But just because the Internet is seen as the new force in news media does not mean it is dominant. 
Television has, of course, been global for a while. But now, technological changes, which have fueled the rise of online news, have also allowed newspapers to print and distribute editions across the world. In fact, Internet news, which is seen as the big competitor for traditional markets, does not offer that much variety. Often, the sources are the online versions of the newspapers, whereas television, in order to offer something different, has had to come up with a much more mixed bag of reporting, from hard news to light reports on celebrity events. Another issue is reliability. The Internet is virtually unregulated, so anything can be reported there, whether true or not. Journalists on newspapers have fought a long, hard battle to fight intervention and to retain the freedom of the press. Television, however, is seen as critical to political power and has become subject to harsh controls about what it can or cannot say. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.